Hello, everyone. My name is Virain Murthy. I am the chair of this year's annual conference on South Asia, and I teach transnational Asian history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It is our pleasure to welcome you all to the 49th annual conference on South Asia and this year's Joseph W. Elder keynote lecture. We thank you all for your continued support of the conference throughout our move to this online environment. We encourage you to submit your questions via the questions tab, and our speaker will respond to your questions following the presentation as time allows. We ask that all participants our participants help us to create a safe virtual space for learning and exchange and engage respectfully and professionally with the speaker and other participants in the chat. The annual conference on South Asia reserves the right to remove any disruptive participants from this event. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Radhika Desai. Radhika Desai is professor at the Department of Political Studies, University of Manitoba, Winnipeg, Canada. She has published widely on Indian politics and global political economy. Now, um, there are a lot of publications and a lot of achievements, so I'm just going to mention a few. Um, she is author of Geopolitical Economy After U.S. Hegemony, Globalization, and Empire, published in 2013, Slouching Towards Ayodhya, from Congress to Hindutva in Indian politics, where there's a second revised edition in 2004. Um, Intellectuals and Socialism, Social Democrats and the Labor Party, published in 1994, which, won, which was a new statement, statement and society book of the month. Um, and she's editor of Revitalizing Marxist Theory for Today's, Capitalists, for today's Capitalism. Um, she's also author of numerous articles in economic and political uh, weekly, New Left Review, and other journals art, uh, articles. I'm not going to mention all of them. Um, but I will say that uh, Professor Desai's work has been extremely important in rethinking global capitalism, the nation state, and, trans and the transformations of geopolitics. Indeed, as the title of a recent book tells us, which is um, geopolitical economy, it's also in the title of today's talk, she brings the problem of geopolitics back to the center of political theory and Marxist theory in particular. This provides her a unique perspective from which to rethink the trajectory of South Asian politics. And we will see this in her talk tonight, which is entitled Hindutva in India's International Posture, a Geopolitical Economy. Please join me in welcoming Radhika Desa. Thank you. Thanks very much, Virain. And uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here and to address this conference, even though we must meet by Zoom. And uh, therefore, there's uh, something lacking in, in, in all of this. But nevertheless, let's hope let's try and make the best of this as you can see i've slightly changed the title and i've just called it the geopolitical economy of modi's foreign policy posture and uh, so in outline what i would like to do today is uh oh hang on. Um, sorry my um, powerpoint oh i see okay um right so in outline what i would like to do is make a few introductory remarks then talk a little bit about what i mean by geopolitical economy and also give you the outline of what i consider to be a new narrative of how to understand the evolution of the world economy under the dominance of capitalism uh, in a very, very brief outline. I should say, by the way, that this lecture is going to be a rather fast paced and whistle, sort of whistle stop tour of some very key uh, ideas, both about India and about the wider world within which India must find its place, has been trying to find its place. And so uh, it will be, as I say, it will be pretty packed and I hope to finish it on time. Um, so I will give you a brief outline of that. Then we will be ready to take a look at exactly how to understand the geopolitical economy of independent India's non-aligned foreign policy posture. That is to say, the posture that we most people would agree that India had at least until the end of the until the disintegration of the Soviet Union, and. <clears throat> And then how there was a movement from essentially this non-aligned posture to what some people have called a multi-alignment posture or a 
different posture. Um, and, and, and in order to understand these shifts as well, in addition to changes in the world economy, we will be trying to understand the domestic political shifts that have uh, that have undertaken in the political economy, which consists of the political failure of the Nehruvian project and the default shift to marketist economic policies that followed. And um, I'll underline that because unlike a lot of people who will argue that uh, the shift to marketist or neoliberal economic policies only began in 1991 with the Narasimha Rao's government, government's move to, uh, uh, to well, uh, uh, with the economic crisis and the acceptance of the IMF structural adjustment program. I would date it much earlier. And I'll talk about that. Uh, we will also talk uh, this uh, kind of changes in the change in political economy also translated into changes in the social structure as rising middle class, middle class provincial property classes, as I call them, uh, following uh, K. Balagopal's uh, uh, designation. So this, this uh, group essentially emerged out of the agrarian sector, the more prosperous sections of the agrarian sector, and joined the upper caste property to create a sort of pan-Indian middle and upper caste class, which um, uh, is an important sociological reality in India today and how this change in, in, uh, in society also translated in major changes in party politics involving the decline of Congress party, the rise of the provincial uh, parties of the provincial property classes, and finally the rise of Hindutva. And of course, these three combine in really interesting ways. Um, with, with this background, then we are ready to understand the rupture and the dangers represented uh, uh, by Modi's foreign policy for India, and then I will make some concluding remarks. So let me begin with my introductory remarks. So many expect uh, many expect uh, Modi's foreign policy to be distinctive. After all, uh, Modi uh, has, uh, unlike Vajpayee before him, Modi has a, a, a his own a single party majority. He's he himself has a personally rather aggressive style, and certainly displays manifests great ideological devotion to the ideas surrounding Hindutva. Um, and of course, uh, 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 many people have uh, uh, seen this. You you know, many people talk about uh, Modi's foreign policy being distinctive. But Ian Hall's very well-received book uh, has emphasized how emphasized the continuities of India's foreign policy, at least in Modi's first term. And this he attributes largely to the intellectual emptiness of Hindu. But basically, his argument is that it was not possible for Modi to transform Indian foreign policy in any major fashion simply because the Hindutva does not provide the intellectual ammunition, the intellectual wherewithal to do it with. Now, while not at all disagreeing that Hindutva is indeed intellectually empty, my own argument is that foreign policies are not made by ideologies alone. However, However skimpy or robust they may be, what we need is a structural view of the political, and the geopolitical economy of the, that particular country's foreign policy. And therefore, and that must take into account interests as well as personalities and ideologies. And here, I should say that I'm particularly thankful to Virin because uh, his invitation essentially has meant that for the first time, I am combining what I have, the work I have done on India's political economy and my work on geopolitical economy for the first time. So just to uh, give you a very quick idea uh, uh, on India's political economy, my basic work has been precisely to do this, this kind of three part study of how India's political economy has changed, how that has led to changes in the caste class structure of India's uh, of India, particularly how it has led to changes in the ruling uh, caste class structure. So this particular article, the caste of anti-secularism, by the way, you will find all of these uh, uh, articles in uh, on my academia.edu website. So I've done work on that. And I have also worked on very closely understanding the patterns revealed by India's election. So the 2004 election, the 20, uh, 2009 election, the 2014 election, and the uh, 2019 election is something I, I, I've already presented on. I've, I've sort of written it up, but not yet published it. And in addition, I've also my my understanding of, of Hindutva is also rooted in understanding the nature of Hindutva in Gujarat. So 
this is broadly the political economy work that I have also, uh, that I am now going to combine with my work on geopolitical economy, which includes the book that Virain mentioned, various edited collections such as these two here, um, a recent work on uh, uh, which I've co-authored with Michael Hudson on uh, 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 on uh, dollar, essentially the, the the fate of the dollar's hegemony, um, and some uh, work I've been doing on uh, how this is related to Marx in particular. My, my argument is that the ideas of geopolitical economy that I'm going to present are deeply rooted in Marx. And the key reason why we do not understand this is that thanks to the incursion of neoclassical economics into Marxism, creating something called Marxist economics, there has been a certain bias in, in, in the understanding of most Marxists towards understanding the world in cosmopolitan terms as though nations did not matter, whereas I argue that Marx and Engels thought of nations as central to understanding the workings of politics. And finally, my work on geopolitical economy will also extend to understanding the impact of the present crisis, the pandemic crisis, the coronavirus crisis, which I began in a series of journalistic articles, but which I'm now converting into a book on coronavirus and capitalism, uh, talking about exactly how the pandemic is telling on capitalism, both in the sense that it is putting unexpected burdens on capitalism with which capitalism seems to be unable to cope and revealing the dirty secrets of capitalism, telling on capitalism in that sense and showing us the sheer extent to which capitalism has become financialized, unequal, uh, uh, riddled with, with a myriad of inequalities and, 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 and so on, and of course productively uh, uh, very debilitated. So this is the uh, combination that I'm going to try to put uh, before you. So the decisive shift that I'm trying to understand by means of both my work on the domestic political economy of India and the geopolitical economy of the trajectory of capitalism in the world today uh, uh, allows us to see that the decisive shift represented by Modi in India's foreign policy consists in an ideological tilt towards a declining economically failing United States and uh, against a rising and economically successful China. It entails uh, uh, putting India in a situation of not learning from China, a country that is most comparable to China. People forget that in 1949, when the, uh, when the communists uh, uh, won the, the civil war in China and essentially established the, the People's Republic of China, China was poorer than India. And so uh, uh, it, it would be a shame if India, uh, uh, Indians were not trying to at least get, you know, understand what China has got right. Um, the shift also involves making India poorer, less powerful and less influential. It involves setting India on a path to war, possibly including nuclear war. Uh, and this is can be due to one or more of several different factors, including rising border and other tensions with China, rising military cooperation with Israel, complete with an ideological alignment of Hindutva and Zionism, intensification of tensions with neighbors, particularly Pakistan, including deep and internally corrosive in Islamophobia, internally corrosive because, of course, India has a very substantial uh, 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 Muslim minority and uh, sorry and, and people forget uh, uh, as well that if India had not been partitioned that India would have been the largest Muslim country in the world by far leaving Hindutva very very little opportunity to emerge but that's another thing we can discuss um, and finally it, it puts India on the side of a military power whose military failures seem to be directly proportional to the astronomical sums that it spends on the military and the recent very ignominious withdrawal from Afghanistan is uh, only the recent uh, episode in a very very long recent and perhaps most ignominious episode in a long trail of ignominious episodes. I mean it is not by chance that people thought of uh, the analogy between Kabul and Saigon uh, 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 in the way in which the airlift of the remaining personnel uh, of U US personnel occurred. Um, 
So Modi's foreign policy, like all his other policies, it is important to understand. So th there is a decisive shift, but like all his other policies, they do not arise from belief, they do not arise from ideology, but they arise from his corporate connections. Modi is the one prime minister who is more closely aligned to the top uh, echelons of corporate India and more completely dependent on them for winning his single party majorities than any other government in the world. This is also the element that creates the, uh, the, the uh, that separates uh, uh, him from the rest of India. The corporate class, uh, capitalist classes of India, therefore, have foisted Modi on India just when they have exhausted the utilities for India's development, as other corporate capitalist classes have for growth and development elsewhere. And this element of my argument will become clearer as I outline geopolitical economy. Um, and I would say that even they, that is to say the corporate capitalist classes, may live to regret uh, that the tiger they chose to mount in 2013-14. Uh, so what then is geopolitical economy? So it is a new approach to understanding world affairs, which challenges the dominant cosmopolitan views. By cosmopolitan, I mean views of world affairs in which nation states are inconsequential, in which the division of the world into a large number of nation states is immaterial. And such views include 19th century free trade or 20th century discourses of US hegemony, globalization, and American empire. In the place of these cosmopolitan discourses, geopolitical economy emphasizes the materiality of nations. Um, uh, it understands this materiality to be rooted in the contradictions of capitalism, which needs state management through international and domestic actions. That is to say, because capitalism is contradictory, because it leads per constantly to crises major and minor, it means that the state has always had to be directly involved in managing these crises. It can manage them by repressing the working class, by making concessions to the working class, etc., at home, by regulating capitalism in various ways. And it can also manage them through imperialist actions by essentially externalizing the consequences of the contradictions of capitalism. For example, finding outlets for its excess of, cap of, of, of commodities and capital, to just give you one example. So, uh, 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 this is, so, so, so it is rooted in these contradictions of capitalism, and these very contradictions of capitalism give rise to what Trotsky called the uneven and combined development of capitalism, a dialectic of sorts between uneven and combined development in the relations of producing nations of the capitalist world. Um, a couple of things to unpack here: the 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 the, the late. Uh, uneven and combined development is rightly, of course, attributed to Trotsky, but I have shown in many of my writings that this idea is there in Marx and Engels and in many other contemporaries of Trotsky. So in a sense, it was an idea that was around which Trotsky then simply crystallized in some of his writing. Uh, secondly, that Marx himself wrote a great deal about this and the, the phrase relations of producing nations is his. And he basically is, uh, is urging on us a way of understanding uh, the relations between countries in the capitalist epoch as relations that uh, in which the production matters in which the economies of these uh, uh, countries matter whether they are pre-capitalist capitalist or of course as would be after 1917 post-capitalist countries so there is a dialectic therefore between uneven and combined development what does this dialectic consist of it consists of dominant nations seeking to create and maintain the unevenness of capitalist development based on a complementarity between their own high value production and the low value production of the countries they dominate so that's one side of the dialectic. Dominant nations want to essentially create a situation in which they subordinate other countries and impose upon them the requirements of being the hewers of wood and bearers of water, so, so to speak, for them, for them, and of course, to be the outlets for their excess commodities and capital. But of course, countries that uh, are threatened with this or are actually suffering this, if they can, they do resist. And this gives rise to the other side of the dialectic in which nations, threatened with or actually suffering such subordination, seek to challenge the dominance that they are threatened with or suffer through 
what Trotsky called combined development for want of a better word that seek relations of similarity. And by combined development, I mean, and in geopolitical economy, the, 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 the idea of geopolitical economy, in this, what combined development means essentially is state-directed, state-led, often protectionist development in order to create relations of similarity, rejecting the complementarity and creating relations of similarity. That is to say, essentially, of fostering development in your own country. This dialectic is belied by the dominant ideologies of cosmopolitan ideologies of free trade, globalization, US hegemony, etc. Because basically, just as in the domestic politics of any country, the ruling ideas are the ideas of the ruling classes. So also at the world level, though there is no world state, there is no world ruling class. Nevertheless, the dominant countries, uh, the ideas of the dominant countries are the ones that have tended to dominate. And these ideas are their ideas because they serve their interests. How do they serve their interests? In the following way, that cosmopolitan ideologies essentially urge the subordinate nations not to play a very big role and therefore leave their countries open to penetration by metropolitan capital commodities and of course open to supply metropolitan capital with cheap inputs and of course with labor as and when needed not always but as and when needed so the argument of geopolitical economy is that rather than free trade globalization, hegemony, or empire, productive capacity has actually spread around the world via combined development. It is when nations have resisted domination or threatened domination that they have essentially uh, acted to develop their own economies. And this is how economies have historically developed. So the story of the world economy is not one of increasing globalization or a succession of hegemonies. You know, before the US, you had Britain. And before Britain, you had Holland. And before Holland, you had the Italian city states. This is you know, often a very eruditely built story, but it is actually not very credible if you look at it closely. So rather, in fact, the story of the world economy is one of increasing multipolarity or more or, or, or to, to use an expression that I've borrowed from Hugo Chavez since writing geopolitical economy increasing pluripolarity. The word is better for me. I consider it better because it indicates that not only are there multiple poles of power, but each of them is distinct because, of course, it each represents a distinct national history, distinct set of institutions. Just as we know, Japanese capitalism, Swedish capitalism, and American capitalism are three quite distinct identities, just as Chinese socialism and Cuban socialism are quite distinct identities as well. So it is better to think of it as pluripolarity. Geopolitical economy integrates Marxism, not Marxist economics, which I've already said is among part of the problem, but integrates Marxism and as well as a, the vast set of uh, the vast literature on so-called developmental states, which interestingly has been largely pursued by people who are not Marxists or did not work, not particularly prone to consider themselves Marxists. And geopolitical economy puts both classes and nations as agents of history in the same frame as Marx and Engels did. So in outline, how would we see the world economy, the history of the world economy uh, from a geopolitical economy time frame? So I've divided this into two perspectives. Um, uh, uh, before the 1970s and since the 1970s. So very quickly, in the middle of the 19th century, what you get is the world dominance of the first industrial power, namely the UK. But what's interesting about it is how short-lived it already is, because already by the 1870s, so you kind of move from the high noon of British industrial power in the middle of the 19th century, already within about 20 years, you've moved to a situation when Germany, the United States, Japan, pursue contender or combined development and challenge Britain's industrial and imperial power, making the world already pluripolar. So I, this, the moment of 1870 is already a moment in which the world has become pluripolar. Britain continues, of course, to exercise the commercial and financial dominance uh, by the supremacy of sterling, but this is 
critically thanks to its empire. And even though Britain sits, still sits on the vast, uh, the biggest empire ever, this role of sterling is also challenged by the likes of Germany. Now, the competition between these multitude, th these already plural number of, uh, of capitalist powers, their competition for markets and colonies leads to the First World War. And the First World War, in fact, is not just a you know, six-year affair. It actually inaugurates a long 30-year crisis, to use Arno Meyer's term, that, that, that lasts from 1914 to 1945, which is the culmination, which is a result of the culmination of the competition for markets, economic territory and colonies among the major capitalist powers, and also constitutes the peak of imperial power. After that, imperial power is beginning its long decline. It sometimes doesn't look that way. You know, whoever would have thought of talking about the decline of imperial power back in the 80s and 1990s when the United States seemed to be imposing such punishing uh, structural adjustment programs and so on on the rest of the world. But from the long term perspective, that's what we see is a decline in imperial power. The third 30 years crisis is bookended. A very good uh, uh, symptom of this is that the 30 years crisis is bookended on the one hand, on the one side that it's beginning by the Russian revolution and uh, at its end by the Chinese revolutions, the two most momentous socialist revolutions to date, shrinking the space for capitalism and opening the aperture for socialism, for decolonization and other forms of imperialism. The 30 years crisis coincides also, and this is important to underline because it becomes relevant later, with the maturity of capitalism. The monopoly form of capitalism completes the historical mission of capitalism as Marx saw it. Insofar as capitalism was historically progressive, it was historically progressive because it socialized labor, both between firms and later on within firms. It did it brutally, it did it chaotically, but it did that. But now, having accomplished that, Capitalism was no longer historically progressive. It was, in fact, ripe for socialism. And many people saw this at the time. Again, long discussion. We can discuss it if you are interested. And also, of course, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, even though this was the case, and even though working classes in many uh, uh, first world countries, many metropolitan countries, were highly organized, there was no socialist revolutions in the homelands of capitalism, only social democracy. The revolutions of any note have taken place outside the imperial homelands, and they have been as important for their anti-imperialist role as they have been for their socialist role. Thanks to the dialectic of uneven and combined development, interestingly enough, again, the maturity of capitalism, the development of large monopoly firms in, 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 in economies dominated by large monopoly firms actually takes place outside uh, Britain among the contender powers like Germany, like Japan, and like the United States as it was up until the 1970s. The Russian and Chinese revolution add socialist combined development to the repertoire of combined development. So, so far, uh, the combined development that you see in, in Germany and in Japan and the United States to capitalist forms. But after 1917, you had the addition of the socialist form as well. Um, and then post Second World War decolonization further reduced imperial power through the third world, Im world impulse for national autonomous development with its distinctively left world uh, uh, tilt. So capitalism in the first world, uh, and, and finally, capitalism in the first world survived and experienced its golden age thanks to the vast infrastructure of socialistic measures that we today call the Keynesian welfare state. So in practically all parts of the world, the maturity of capitalism, its ripeness for socialism is in many ways manifest. There are socialist revolutions, there are uh, autonomous national development takes socialistic forms, and plus, even in the homelands of capitalism, you have capitalism surviving chiefly because it is taking so many leaves out of the socialist copybook. Um, finally, in, in the, one should add here that the, in, in this period, the United States seeks 
under line six, attempts to emulate British 19th century dominance in the 20th century, but it does so in vain. And it does so in vain, even though it has already uh, essentially diluted that ambition. It knows that it can never acquire a, 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 an empire of the size, and had not in the 20th century condition. So it says, okay, we will make the dollar the world's money. The problem with this was that without an empire, which had allowed Britain to export capital and supply the world with liquidity, the United States could only supply the world with liquidity by running deficits. And here, as the Belgian economist Robert Riffin pointed out long ago, back in 1960, that in fact the problem with this was that, of course, the bigger the deficits are, the less attractive the dollar is, the more downward pressure there is on the value of the dollar. So. Uh, since the 1970s, what we have seen then is something like this. Essentially, the, uh, the Keynesian welfare state arrangements went into crisis in the 1970s. And when they did, the first world faced a choice. Either it could deepen the socialistic measures, expanding productive capacity and demand, particularly in the third world, to continue on the post-war path of growth and, 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 and so on, to essentially continue the golden age. Or to roll them back, roll back these socialistic measures, give capitalists greater freedom from state, social, and union controls that they demanded via their intellectuals and think tanks. So th that was those were the two options. Essentially, the option was turn left, turn right. First world chose to turn right. It chose to turn into what we today call neoliberalism. And of course, this was uh, contemporaneous with, the, with this was also the crisis of the dollar uh, uh, when because essentially due to the operation of the Triffin dilemma because the dollar became less and less attractive drained gold out of the United States the link between the dollar and gold had to be broken and the important thing I want to underline here is not to go over that history, but basically to underline that since 1971, the only way the dollar has remained the, wo the world's currency or appeared to remain the world's currency in a, some kind of continuous fashion is because the United States has helped engineer a series of financializations, a series, a series of expansion of dollar-denominated international financial activity whose effect is not to you know aid production or anything in fact it is to to, to have an adverse effect on production but it, but by expanding financial uh, activity it has essentially created an artificial purely financial demand for the dollar which counteracts the triffin dilemma's downward pressure on the dollar so in this context then since the 1970s, what has happened? Neoliberalism has failed to revive first world productive economies. Instead, it has only produced financializations, which have, of course, been encouraged for reasons I have just said, uh, encouraged by the United States, which have further constricted production. So essentially, the entire neoliberal era from 1980s onwards have been an era of lower growth than previously, low levels of employment, stagnant wages, rising inequality, and of course, more recently, also shockingly rising poverty. Neoliberalism not only failed to revive first world productive economies, it could not have done so. It assumed a robust competitive capitalism that no longer exists. The freedoms that it gave when it is given to monopoly capitalism could not elicit the response of productive vigor, but only of the vices of senility, the vices of monopoly, the vices of financialization. Another important point to note is that neoliberalism has advanced unevenly. It has gone farthest in the liberal Anglosphere and uh, 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 given rise, uh, it, it, it has gone farthest in the liberal Anglosphere. So the US and the UK have been the most neoliberal economies, followed by some of the other English Anglo economies, whereas in many ways the continent, Japan, have retained many of their uh, contender features, their more planned state directed features. And this has, of course, given rise to a vast varieties of capitalism literature. Over the neoliberal era, each successive decade of neoliberalism has had worse economic performance than the last. Um, and in this context, the U.S. and First World victory in the Cold War against the Soviet Union, against allegedly communism, was actually pyrrhic. Because what happened was people expected two things out of it. One, 
was that the world would become unipolar, would be essentially peacefully united and, uh, under US leadership. But in fact, what we have seen is because of low growth in the West and faster growth in China and some of the other BRICS economies, we have seen the further advance of pluripolarity. And secondly, we have not seen any peace dividend because unilateral U.S. aggression has remained, uh, un sorry, because the U.S. has reacted to its decline with unilateral U uh, aggression against the rest of the world, which has only chalked up a series of failures with the one in Afghanistan being the worst. So the 2010s as a result have been the worst uh, decade of neoliberalism. The contrast between the productive stagnation and financial explosion had become starker than ever. And even before the pandemic, many expected a knockdown crisis of capitalism, uh, of continuing if constricted financialization and severely weakened productive systems. So the pandemic may have triggered the crisis, but it did not cause it. The crisis was waiting to happen anyway so in the first world particularly in the neoliberal leaders of uh, of the anglosphere will not get out of the crisis for the simple reason that the only measures they will consider are neoliberal ones and uh, and, that, uh, and and uh, and uh, the neoliberal ones and those are on, those are the ones that will profit uh, uh, that will provide profit opportunities for corporate capital so we're now ready to try to understand um what is happening in, in independent India's foreign policy posture. So basically, in the early Indian uh, in independent India's foreign policy posture, which essentially independent India emerged from a long challenge to imperialism that included socialism and that matured in the 30 years crisis. So you see in the in the uh, period of uh, uh, period, the decades are running up to Indian independence, socialist leaders and nationalist leaders of all sorts meeting regularly, uh, trying to understand the world conjuncture and essentially pursuing their inter the anti-imperialist agenda as a common platform. The Indian orientation, therefore, was one shared by other, other anti-imperialist forces, by, the, by Soviet Russia, by Chinese communists. And it was essentially oriented towards socialist or socialistic forms of autonomous national development. And this tilt uh, that India uh, developed in this early period was serendipitously helped when the USSR supported India in its complex conflicts with Pakistan, which also sent Pakistan into, of course, the US's deadly embrace with all the consequences that have followed since. India's non-alignment was reflected in its refusal to participate in American efforts to contain the USSR and the PRC. Its leadership of the non-aligned movement and associated organizations of third world assertion, whether you talk about the creation of UNCTAD or the call for a new international economic order and many other such initiatives. And of course, the recognition and support for Palestine, the People's Republic of China, which, as some of you will remember, was for decades denied its rightful place in the United Nations and in the Security Council. However, Nehru's fateful mishandling of border disputes with China enabled the right, both within and outside Congress, including the Hindutva right, to begin to establish the distinctive and distinctively dangerous anti-communist and anti-Chinese foreign policy. So uh, uh, now uh, this was already happening, but then you also began to see a different set of changes from non-alignment to what has been called multi-alignment. Uh, they are, these changes are generally dated from the early 1990s and of course, as you know, most people also date the changes in India's internal domestic politics towards free market economics, etc. to this date as well and to the disintegration of the Soviet Union. So the, the dominant narrative goes that Narasimha Rao rejected the Nehruvian path of socialistic, self-reliant, autonomous national development and in foreign policy terms, he initiated the ideas of looking east. He welcomed foreign direct investment. He welcomed all, and he also tried to create better relations with neighbors, if, if only because this would provide India the room to look beyond its immediate neighborhood to the wider world. So this was a part of the wider opening up of India's economy. However, while continuing with the marketist and neoliberal turn, the Vajpayee government struck a very discordant note. Um, uh, obviously, the Vajpayee government, more or less at the uh, start of its uh, uh, rule, uh, 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 initiated the 
forefront to nuclear tests, which threatened China and portrayed uh, 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 when, and were portrayed as anti-China by Vajpayee in his missive to uh, President Clinton at the time. Uh, there is also by this time a very distinctive pro-US tilt. So it's no longer multi-alignment, but clear US alignment. As Vajpayee terms the United States a natural ally and offers it help in Afghanistan after 9-11, and China is now beginning to be named as potential enemy number one. And again, in the UPA Congress led UPA government under the Singh government, you see a, a, a substantial moderation of this stance. So uh, 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 essentially, while there is multi alignment, it's so sort of return to multi alignment, not to pro US tilt, prioritizing India's developmental needs, not necessarily India's corporate needs. Uh, while rejecting state control development, yes, this is definitely a, a continuity, recognition of what was then beginning to be called geoeconomics, uh, a, a better regional integration with neighbors and India as a developmental and democratic model and the transmission of this model. So these are elements of the Singh doctrine that are available or that are uh, announced at this time. Now, in all of this, so we can see that there's a sort of Pull, tug and pull between the Hindutva element and the Congress element. But what you see uh, with Modi is something decisively different. Contrary to the general opinion that Modi does not constitute a major shift in India's foreign policy, I would argue that he does. And to understand why, we need to understand the domestic roots of India's foreign policy. Um, now, I'm, uh, I know I'm uh, uh, kind of rich. I hope this will be. I will, I'll be done in the next 10 minutes. So before 19, before 2014, I used to stress the continuities between Congress and Hindutva. But with the onset of Modi, I have increasingly begun to stress the major discontinuity that Modi's particular uh, uh, brand of Hindutva represents. So I'm going to go through this rather quickly. Uh, and again, we can have questions and answers later. But my own argument is that a shift towards marketist uh, type neoliberal type of policies can already be seen in the late 1960s. I have called this uh, long period of transition to marketist policies the slow motion counter revolution. And I have argued that it is not because Nehru, Nehruvian developmentalism as an idea, as a set of, as a theory about how India should develop was flawed. What the problem was not any problem with the larger plan for development, the problem lay in Congress's political incapacity to carry it out. Congress lacked the political ability and the will to transform agriculture in the egalitarian manner in which it need to be transformed in order to sustain uh, uh, industrialization. Land reform, unfortunately, was limited to transferring land from landlords to dominant upper middle class peasants in areas of landlordism. So the, it was essentially very limited. So the result was a combination of agrarian crisis because agriculture did, was not transformed in the way it was. It did not become sufficiently productive. And the departure of dominant caste linkmen from Congress <clears throat> uh, 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 in a long drawn out and often reverse process, creating a proliferating set of regional Congress parties, <coughs> farmers movements, and essentially <coughs> parties of the provincial property classes. <coughs> yeah, so, uh, and I, I'll, I'll, so, so, so what I've often called regional parties in India, I call parties of the provincial property classes. So these are essentially the dominant castes of, of each region that uh, revolted against Congress in one form or another. So the Marathas in Maharashtra or the Patidars in Gujarat and Patidars and Kshatriyas in Gujarat and other such. Uh, groups around the country. So this combination of political and economic crisis <clears throat> essentially led to a situation in which the Green Revolution, of course, became necessary and became uh, the Green Revolution itself was very liberalizing in the agricultural sphere, which was, of course, the largest sector of the Indian economy in employment terms anyway. And uh, also, therefore, <coughs> second place, the broader bi liberal bias of of uh, economic policy. And this liberal bias was later solidified by the Janata government, by the Mrs. Gandhi government, the Rajiv Gandhi government, the Rao government, and the Vajpayee government. And although it was moderated somewhat under Singh, 
thanks to left influence uh, uh, because of Singh's minority status. But essentially from 1968 elections to the 1970s and 80s, uh, farmers' movements emerged, and then eventually, by, by the 1980s, they became beginning. They began to transform themselves into parties of the provincial property classes, and they are different from farmers' movements in the sense that they now represent more mature. They're not just uh, 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 rich farmers or capitalist farmers. They represented more mature. The maturation of this class, uh, the diversification of this class, diversification of their investments from agriculture to industry, from rural to urban areas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you began to get a provincial property class whose roots lay in the agrarian sector. So as a result, uh, there were three main political trends that you can see, and I, I, I'm afraid I won't be able to uh, describe it to you, so I'm not going to show you the charts, maybe in question and answer I may, but the three main political trends is that Congress began its very long-term decline. Maybe I will just show you one of these charts. Uh, um, these are just the, <clears throat> maybe this is better, this is seats by party category. So the blue line represents the long-term decline of Congress. The orange line represents the long-term rise of, the, of Hindutva. And the green line represents the uh, rise and fairly stable presence of the uh, parties of the provincial property classes. When you see vote shares by these party categories, you will see the same trends. So these are the three main trends. And this, these trends, which were essentially the organic result of the failures of, of, of Congress to essentially implement Nehruvian developmentalism, this, this was just the outcome of this. So they had brought the BJP to power, but only in coalition, either in actual party coalitions or where the, the dominant, the provincial property classes had directly joined the BJP, as in states like Gujarat, for example, uh, and through a social coalition in the sense that the, through a change in the social base of the BJP itself, expanding it beyond its sort of relatively narrow urban upper caste. Uh, 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 base. Okay, so in this context, then the BJP pursue in foreign policy terms, it pursued a neoliberal agenda and a pro US and pro Israel anti China anti Pakistan policies, but they had to be moderated by the coalitional status of the BJP. But the current Modi government is different. It is different. It's a completely different creature. It's majority status is is, is propped up by corporate uh, capital uh, in uh, corporate capital india's corporate capitalist classes and the munificent bankrolling of modi specifically of modi personally and of course this has put the modi government out of touch with its middle class provincial property class support base so what you see is regular revolts uh, fill uh, uh, regular revolts uh, 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 provide much of the within the BJP provide much of the content in the news media and of course today there is a vast and formidable farmers movements many of uh, uh, many elements of which used to be supporters of the BJP and we see also a trend towards BJP uh, a trend towards fewer BJP and BJP and allies rule states so this has also taken india's foreign policy the modi government has also taken india's foreign policy in a distinctly pro capitalist and pro us direction so under modi indian foreign policy is becoming pro us just when the us economy is in irretrievable decline as long as capitalist policies rule and in the united states no other possibilities on the agenda right now um a new phase of neoliberalism may be launched under Biden, which I have called pseudo philanthropic or pseudo public interest neoliberalism, in which basically big corporate capital will make money by supplying the state rather than the consumers with products and services that are deemed essential for public consumption. And they, of course, will get essentially risk free profits. Um, the competitive sector in, of the U.S. is uh, it's important to know that whatever competitive sector U.S. has, competitive on world markets, that is, are essentially confined to military production and sectors like big pharma that are reliant on the enforcement of intellectual property rights. America's international influence and attractiveness are also in catastrophic decline, with rival China gain, grow, growing in strength. 
its victims multiplying as the US imposes sanctions after sanctions to our country after country. And even allies are alienated both because of sanctions, because of other ham handed uh, actions, such as the recent announcement of the uh, AUKUS alliance, which so uh, offended President Macron and the inability of its own military to win any war as demonstrated in Afghanistan. And India is not, under Modi, India is being anti-China just when India, China demonstrates the necessity and the power of controlling capital rather than giving it reign as in India or the US or other capitalist countries, where China emerges as a growth engine of the world economy. Uh, where China emerges as an attractive partner for trade and investment and an example, if not model, for many successful policies and today leads an alliance of powers opposed to the senile, predatory, neoliberal, financialized and militarily aggressive capitalism and is instead committed to expanding pluripolarity. So, in conclusion then, and I'm sorry I've taken uh, so much longer than, uh, uh, but this will be quick. Essentially, Indian politics today says that Indian politics and the Modi today says India can have any sort of development it likes so long as it is part of what co uh, part of what corporate India and increasingly the corporate US offers that this represents a qualitative change and leaves out even substantial sections of the middle castes and classes which the BJP uh, will either have to pay for or will try to repress with great force. Its limits have been reached with seven years of Modi's corporate fascist government's economic, social and political disasters, plus COVID, plus farmers' movements and wider unrest. And this cannot be corrected unless the political capacity is created for something resembling Nehruvian developmentalism with an open horizon to socialism, that is, which can contemplate forms of socialism. And it has also put India on a disastrous foreign policy course that threatens nuclear war in South Asia, participation in wider wars, including nuclear wars on the US side against China, ties uh, India to an economy that is incapable of dynamism, and makes India into a vassal state committed to buying its weapons and being tied to US and NATO interoperability. So the only way forward is really for a coalition of lower castes and classes Adivasis, minorities, women, creating a majority that challenges the corporate fascist program that favors a tiny minority of India and appreciates that orig India's original socialistic course was broadly correct. It was the only way for a large and poor country like India to develop while adapting the original program to the current time and circumstances. I think I'll end there. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, that was uh, really uh, insightful. And uh, I'm um, now going to open the floor for uh, questions. Um, and I'm going to see if we have any questions here on the in the chat. 